Hello, everyone. Yes, it has been tough times since this COVID hit us, but we decided not to let this pandemic stop us and our community to get together and do what we're best at, empower, enable, and enact more change for the better. Hello to everyone joining from um, all over the world. Welcome to Change 2020. It's an online event proudly brought to you by Social Marketing Griffiths. On behalf of the entire SMG team and co-chairs of Change 2020, including myself, J1 Kim, and my mate, Alex Campbell, we welcome you all. Before we begin today, could I please ask you to mute your mics off and um, so we can avoid any background noises. And um, if you haven't already, please also turn off your videos so we can ensure the best possible streaming quality for this event. Also, today's event is being recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube channel following this event. To kick off, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our engagement director, Dr. Timo Dictrich, to officially open our Change 2020 online event. Over to you, Timo. Thank you, Jaywan, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we obviously really wanted to see all of you in person like we did for the last two years. But hey, instead of 150 people getting together in sunny Brisbane, we have now more than 500 registrations from people all over the world. And um, we have you, you here on Zoom and we are also live streaming via YouTube. So to say the least, we're super stoked and super excited to have you all here to soak up some change magic uh, with us today. Um, let me begin by paying our respects to uh, the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, I wanna say that obviously behind every event, uh, there's a group of amazing people that make it happen. Uh, we're social marketing at Griffith, the world's largest university-based social marketing research center. And the Change Conference is a brainchild of our founding director, Sharon Randall Teal. And it first ran in 2018. Uh, the vision for us was to create a face-to-face -face event that would bring together the change agent community with a lineup of people that we knew would have a message to share that could help people achieve more change with less resources spent. Change was there to empower, enable, and enact. And 2018 was a great first year. Um, it was a success, and we had an even better conference in 2019. And it left us hungry for more. So we committed to Change 2020 before we even finished Change 219, and we had all the speakers locked in, and then COVID came. And um, we were tossing and turning, and while the majority of conference organizers, or a lot of them at least, decided to either postpone or cancel their conferences, we made a commitment to bring Change back in an all-new format. So registrations to these events are breaking records for us, and we can't wait for our first three speakers to pick the first free online event of today. So buckle up enjoy and I personally can't wait and that's really all I have to say and that's my cue to hand over to today's MC J1 to give you a rundown of our first event. Thank you Timo, yay. Um, today we have three amazing speakers who will share with you how you can unlock consumer insights that matter and perhaps insights that people would never tell you if you were just to ask them. First, we have Professor Simone Pettigrew, uh, who will highlight the challenges associated with developing social marketing strategies around innovations that have yet to emerge. Next, we have Dr. Zach Fitzwalter, speaking about how understanding your audience is key to designing effective gamification systems for behavior change. And finally, we have James Fitzgerald, who will examine techniques for nudging consumer behavior through digital channels alongside valuable tools to help better understand audience needs and intent. To ease the process of this awesome learning journey, please engage with any polls that may pop onto your screen and ask any questions using the chat function. Alex will be curating questions in the background and we will have a Q&A session after all three speakers. Radio, it's now time to embark on the learning journey. Our very first speaker for Change 2020 is Simone. Um, she's a professorial fellow at the George Institute for Global Health and the University of New South Wales, researching on behavior change across nutrition, physical activity, alcohol consumption, and smoking. Those very tricky social problems to solve. Please join me in welcoming Professor Simone Pettigrew. Hello, everybody, and a big thank you to Sharon and the social marketing team at Griffith for having me on board today. 
So I'll be talking about autonomous vehicles and I'm the program head of food policy at the George Institute. So the link between autonomous vehicles and food policy may not be immediately obvious, but we'll get to that along the way. And we have uh, rates of technology increasing exponentially. So we're in the situation of having to try and apply our marketing principles in the context of a very different environment. So it's a bit difficult to ask people to tell us what they want when they're not sure themselves because they haven't seen it yet. So if we think about driverless cars or autonomous vehicles, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? If you are um, an avid science fiction watcher, for instance, you might be thinking about these um, examples that we have. So we had Herbie the Lovebug out there for many years. We've got Kit, the talking car, and movies like Fifth Element often featured autonomous vehicles. That sort of positions autonomous vehicles as something that's going to happen way off in the future or, or almost in the past, but they're very much coming to our present future. You might not make an immediate public health assumption around autonomous vehicles, but if you look at all those different terms there on that word cloud, at least 18 of those are actually somehow related to autonomous vehicles, which we will work our way through in just a moment. But in you the meantime, this gives you a sorry. little bit of an indication about how traffic will operate once vehicles are driverless. So you can see from this mocked up example here that there aren't any stop signs or traffic lights and there aren't uh, people tapping the brakes and trying to stop in anticipation of other vehicles because the vehicles are communicating with each other and also via a mainframe that's giving them way more information than your typical driver has to work with today. And then someone else has very cleverly mocked up this video that shows how we'll also need to account of other kinds of road users like pedestrians and cyclists, motorcyclists, etc. And that really makes it a very complex road scenario that's going to take a lot of technological minds to work their way through to make sure that everybody is really safe in that environment. So that's 100% automated, but we're progressing incrementally along the way and we're seeing improvements in driving technology that incorporate elements of this bit by bit. If we think about um, driverless technology and how it's going to affect us as individual transport users, we've got various options. So we can own our own autonomous vehicle in the case of a beautiful Tesla car. They're also inventing individual um, helicopters as well, which might actually be more readily available sooner than the cars because of the uh, smaller amount of traffic that have to be dealt with in the air. We've also got public transport options in the forms of trains, buses, shuttles, trackless trams, for instance. Then we've also got what we call mobility as a service. So your autonomous Uber service, for instance, but also longer term, we'll look at having appified transport where you put in where you wanna go from where to where, and it will combine for you first mile, last mile might be an Uber, and it will link you up with public transport in the middle for the longer hauls, just to make it all as smooth as possible and to, um, make it as convenient as all that transport linked up together, talking to each other. There's also logistics and freight. So if we think about trucks, they can operate in a convoy once they're automated. So they can travel very, very close together in slip streams and reduce the amount of um, fuel that they're using. There are also huge time savings here. So for instance, I'm setting my time out here in COVID in Western Australia, and it takes about five days to truck goods from the East Coast to the West Coast because of the driver breaks that need to be factored into the schedule. If vehicles are entirely automated, then that comes down to two days, which is a huge saving. We've also got lots of other kinds of industrial uses. So these are agricultural applications. You can use drone technology to herd cattle and to check fences, and you can use automated tractors and other harvesting tools to do the work that otherwise you need to send lots of staff out there to do. And in times like COVID, that's a particular saving and benefit. Okay, so if we think now in terms of public health applications as we might traditionally think about them, Around the world, about 1.2 million people die on the roads every year, and many, many more millions of people end up in hospital due to crashes. In Australia alone, we have 1,200 people who die a year on the road and about 34,000 who end up in hospital. And that costs our economy about $18 billion. So if we think about all those crashes, about 93% of those are human error. If we can get down to 90% fewer accidents because we pretty much eradicated that human error, then we are literally saving thousands of people's lives and billions of dollars to the economy over time. Now that scenario we're talking about there is full autonomy, but even in partial autonomy, as we can see here in this demonstration video, this is taken from the dash cam of a Tesla vehicle. 
Now you can't hear it on this particular video, but there's a pinging that comes into the cabin of the Tesla as this crash is impending. So not as the crash happens, as it's impending, because the vehicle is pinging off the ground and knows the trajectory of the vehicles in front, and it's able to anticipate the crash and activate the brakes prior to the driver even knowing that there's a problem. So you can see here that the Tesla pulls up and stops ahead of this accident versus the traffic down the right keeps coming forwards because those drivers are having to wait to see the accident before being able to react. So that's technology that is, exists now and that will be improving outcomes for drivers. Then of course we've got particular segments of the population who will benefit greatly from driverless technology and the elderly are probably a, a really important case in point. So those demographic pyramids along the bottom of the screen there, you can see that by mid-century older people will both be a larger proportion of the population, but also a very substantial number of people. So given the fact that a lot of older people can't drive, they have their licenses taken away from them at a point of time. And we've got research that shows that they tend to become much more isolated at that point, their quality of life reduces and their health reduces. And in that particular scenario, being able to provide them with driverless technology can open up their options and enable them to be much more um, socially active and also accessing health services, getting to the supermarket, all those kinds of things. Plus autonomous vehicles have the potential to make life a lot better for people with various disabilities that prevent them from being able to drive. Another consideration is that uh, a lot of our space is taken up by parking, which won't be necessary in a driverless world because the vehicles can trundle off and pick somebody else up and provide another road service. In the CBD area of most cities, around 25% of the space is taken up by parking. So that means that we can liberate that space for a whole bunch of other more important health promoting activities. So for example, we might be able to have much more greenery around producing oxygen, creating more livable spaces. We might be able to use that area to have outdoor gyms and parks that enable people to have, lead more active lifestyles. But of course, with any technology where you have an upside, you're also gonna have a downside. And we can easily see a whole bunch of areas in which life could actually get a whole lot worse with driverless technology unless we are very proactive and get in there at the macro environmental level to try and change people's behaviour before they even adopt these particular probable outcomes. So for instance, if um, we all decide that we're going to buy our own autonomous vehicle because, hey, that would be great, wouldn't it? Door-to-door -door transport. What will happen then is our vehicle will take us into work It'll probably go back home empty because we don't want to pay for parking anywhere. It'll come back and collect us later and take us back home. So we've just doubled the number of kilometres travelled on the roads. So then we've got more congestion and we've got more emissions, which is not ideal. We've also got the situation where that could severely cannibalise our public transport. And again, that would ex exacerbate congestion. We've done some work with people and said, you know, in this driverless world, how would that change your alcohol consumption behaviours? And lo and behold, of course, the intention is to drink more because you can. Another potential outcome is urban sprawl, where because we can use our transit time to do other fun things, we don't mind living further out of town. And that can just lead to um, much greater spread of housing, which we know is not ecologically sound. And that could then result us being in our little pods each day, traveling to and from our workplaces, perhaps eating not very healthy food and perhaps doing a whole lot of sedentary activities instead of using that time for more active pursuits. And here's my food policy area concern is that um, we already know, for instance, that Domino's is investing quite heavily in drone technology to be able to home deliver pizzas because that will reduce their labor costs and it will make cheap, convenient, unhealthy food even easier to get hold of. So at the moment, for instance, you can walk into a, um, a Domino's or a Pizza Hut and get like a, a $4 pizza. If they can get rid of the human cost associated with delivering that to your door, then who would be bothered cooking healthy foods if you can have that kind of thing turning up very quickly and paying very little for it. With the Pizza Hut example there with the truck, they're looking at developing up technology that allows them to have a roaming pizza cooking unit that on transit to your house prepares and cooks your pizza and delivers it to you piping hot. 
What we'd really like to see, of course, is that people decide that they're going to use our autonomous public forms of transport. And those smaller shuttles that you can see there on the screen are a really good example of how we could make transport more on demand rather than having large buses on fixed routes with fixed schedules. We can have a whole range of roaming smaller shuttles instead that are much more flexible. That's an image of a trackless tram there down on the bottom left. And it'd be great if we did use autonomous food delivery to deliver healthy options and attractive options rather than junk food. If we do use our own personal vehicle, perhaps we could use that time for more active pursuits such as exercise. But ideally, a whole bunch of us will decide that we want to become cyclists now because we're much safer on the road when the vehicles are monitoring our presence continually and they've got 360 degree visibility. That'll make cyclists much safer than they are currently. Now that's the ideal world, but when we talk to a whole bunch of people about, well, what would you do if you had an autonomous vehicle? About one in five said that they would choose to use that vehicle instead of walking the trips that they currently walk. About one in three said that they would use that vehicle instead of cycling. And nearly half said that they would use it instead of public transport. So this really hones into us the fact that we need to take a macro environmental stance to the development of autonomous vehicles to make sure that we set up our environments in a way that is conducive to improved health, not deteriorating health. Great. Now you might think to yourself, well, we've got a long time to do that. This technology is quite some way off. So, you know, let's we can do this incrementally. Well, actually this graph is a little bit outdated now, but we've got more than 20 trials happening just in Australia. And there are thousands of trials happening all over the world. There have been millions of kilometers already driven in autonomous vehicles. A couple of cities in the US already have autonomous taxi services set up. And there have been billions of kilometers of um, miles already simulated. So we've got a pretty good understanding of how this is all going to play out. In terms of how people will actually react when this technology is available, we can look back to what happened when the automobile was introduced. So you can see there the picture on the left is the year 1900, when down New York, the main avenue in New York City, we've got one automated vehicle and all the rest are horse and carts. And then the adjacent image shows that just 13 years later, they're just all motorized mechanical vehicles. Those horses and carts are all gone. So that's how quickly that innovation spread back then when the ownership of a vehicle would have constituted a much greater proportion of people's disposable income than it does now. And in Australia, we could potentially even see faster adoption because we are very adaptive to new technology. And an example would be um, mobile phones and smartphones where we were among the fastest in the world to take on that technology. So if we think about, well, how can we preempt this? What kinds of behavior change models can we put in place to be able to anticipate how people will adopt autonomous vehicles and encourage them to take on the forms of traveling that we would like them to? Well, our COMB model, for instance, that sits within the behavior change wheel tells us to look at capability, motivation and opportunity. Now, in the case of new technology that really doesn't exist quite yet, capability and opportunity are very difficult to anticipate. What we can focus on instead is people's motivation. So we've asked people around uh, 2000 Australians, what would you do? Would you be one of the first people to buy an autonomous vehicle? Would you ever buy? And as you can see there around between a quarter and a third of people said that they anticipate that one day they will own one. And would you ever use an autonomous vehicle ride sharing service? So that's you know, about a third as well. So we really need to increase that third category, get more and more people receptive to using autonomous vehicles. And in terms of that, you know, about 14% of people who said that they would be one of the first to buy, it's nice to see that that maps quite nicely onto the standard adoption curve, Rogers adoption curve. So if we add together the innovators and early adopters, that's about 16%. So that's not far off what we're seeing with people expecting themselves to jump on board early. We've also broken that down by age. And as you can see there, older people look like being much less receptive to driverless technology than um, younger people. And that's a bit of an issue when you consider that older people probably have the most to gain from this technology. So we've got some real work to do there to try and encourage that older age group to be more positive. So as part of marketing processes, we would always look at need identification. You know, what do people want out of this technology? In the case of autonomous vehicles, we don't want them just to think about what's in it for them. We also want them to think more broadly. How will this affect other people? How will it affect the planet? 
when we've asked people about their feelings about autonomous vehicles, it's really the responses pop up into that first category, what's in it for me. And we've been able to categorize their responses in terms of whether they were cognitive in nature or emotional. And about a third of people gave really emotional responses, just reflecting that they didn't have much of an idea about how this would look, but they either said, fantastic, love the idea, or they said, that sounds horrendous. I don't wanna be around on this world. And a few people actually said, I hope I'm dead before this happens. In terms of the negative quadrant in the cognitive area, they, they tended to relate their reactions to technology that they know and use. So they would say things like, well, my laptop crashes all the time. How can I possibly trust an autonomous vehicle? They don't kind of think about the fact that if you're in an aeroplane, then it's on autonomous mode most of the time. They really focused on what they see every day in their lives. Those who had the most positive attitudes tended to really focus on tangible elements that they could anchor their ideas about technology to. So, for instance, they would measure, uh, mention specific companies that they thought would be the early people to bring in autonomous technology. So they tended to mention Tesla, Google, Uber, for instance. This group also seemed to sense that it was going to happen sooner rather than later. They perceived it as increasing their safety overall. Quite a few talked about the fact that they liked the idea of um, it being able to park for them because people don't tend to like parking. And quite a few noted the fact that they would be electric and therefore have um, good emission reduction as well. And this where it becomes difficult when we try and get people to anticipate how they would use these products in the future and how we could best get them to gravitate towards shared versions of the technology. And we've got some quotes from famous people here who are leaders in their fields who acknowledge pretty much the same thing, that it is difficult to work with consumers when you're looking at things that haven't really eventuated yet. What we can do potentially is tangibilize this for them so that they can get a feeling of what it would actually look like to make them more receptive to the kinds of technology we want them to use. This um, image here is actually from real world data generated by MIT in the US where they got real drivers to drive around in circles. And then they popped in one autonomous vehicle in one of the circles and that's represented by the red car there. And you can see that just adding one automated vehicle smoothed out traffic flows considerably because the autonomous vehicle again is pinging ahead and knows can anticipate what other cars are doing. And it doesn't really have the same need to tap the brakes all the time like human drivers do. And this tells us that really we need to be working towards the day where we don't have any human drivers. Another way of tangibilizing is to be able to point to the economic benefits and to be able to say, you know, what would this mean for the economy? And when we ask people if they want to use autonomous vehicles, what would they use them for? If they were going on a work commute, would they work during that commute? And when we extrapolated that out to the total population, it came to, next slide, please. It's $20 billion that it would save the Australian economy if people use their commutes for that purpose. So that it could be a really important anchor for public policy people, for instance. The other thing we can do to tangibilize is to tell people more about it, make them aware of very specific potential benefits. When we ask people open access, open response questions about what do you think the benefits would be? Very few responses where they do suggest something, it's typically around accident reduction, about one in five people could suggest that nobody thought about cycling. However, when we then went ahead and suggested specific benefits, you can see there that people's responses jump right up. Sorry, if we can go back one again. And particularly, you can see that our mobility for the elderly and disabled was really the one topic that people could see, yes, that's going to be a distinct benefit. So we need to perhaps then limit down people's options, which is along Henry Ford's lines again. If we want to direct people to the more socially responsible options, perhaps we need to do things that the World Health Organization suggests that are most appropriate when you're looking at health interventions. For instance, with availability, sorry, back a slide. We can make sure that the public transport options are readily available, preferably free if possible, and that lots of cycle paths are available. If we think about affordability, we can um, make sure again that trans public transport wins out cost wise, we can charge people extra penalties for taking cars on public transport routes, and we can perhaps um, put little fees on if you've got empty vehicles using the, um, the roads. When we've tested various messages with people about what would work to make them feel more positive about autonomous vehicles, once again, it was the um, elderly and the disabled, that message was the winning one. So we've got much more work to do in this space to try and figure out what we could do to really push people towards 
the kinds of infrastructure requirements we need to, for the more automated public transport and to encourage people to use it. And here's the team of ours that have been working on that. And a big shout out to Bank West Curtin Economics for funding our work. Thank you. Wow, just brilliant, yeah. Simone. Um, thank you so much for a marvellous talk. Um, I was actually looking at a chat channel and just to see if whether any questions or the comments are coming in, but I'm thinking maybe our audience today is a bit shy to do that. So, but please um, engage with us because um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so please um, click on the chat, which is on the far um, down on the corner of the Zoom meeting and then say hello. And then if you have any questions, please let us know. I can't really wait for the Q&A to kick in, but we can't miss the next speaker, which is Zach. Zach, I'm gonna bring him back. Hi. Hi, so he's a co-founder of Eat More Pixels and TBD game company. He knows that rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior just doesn't motivate us in the way we thought it did. Then what should we do to enable more change? Just gonna welcome Dr. Zach Fitzwalter. Please join me welcoming him. On to you. Thank you, Jaywon. <clears throat> Hi everyone, it's great to be here. Thanks to the amazing Griffith University Change 2020 team for making this event happen and for the invitation to speak. Uh, so yes, my name is uh, Zach Fitzwalter. I completed a PhD in gamification design five years ago now. It's gone very fast. And since then, I uh, have been helping businesses, governments, and non-for-profits learn more about how gamification can be effectively applied to their products and also their internal workplaces. So today I wanted to share with you how gamification is being used to help engage people when it comes to gathering data and consumer insights. So let's get started. Now, having a background in research, I love surveys. I love a good validated measurement tool, but apparently not everyone shares the same love of surveys with me, which is sad. Uh, and this is something that researchers and those gathering insights often struggle with. That is encouraging enough people, not only to start a survey, but also to complete a survey and complete it well. That is just not clicking, not applicable the entire time. And this is the same for any kind of data, opinions or insights we want to gather from people. It can be notoriously difficult to motivate people to provide their time and their insights. So often we resort to rewarding people for their time, for example, by providing gift cards or money. Um, and this is one approach that can work. However, over the last decade or so, we've seen new approaches being used to motivate people to provide their time and their insights. And one such approach is gamification, uh, which is my area of interest. So gamification can be a great approach as it can be simple to add, doesn't really require tangible rewards and can have great results as well. So let's talk a little bit about gamification. It has its roots in video games. The idea is that video games can be really, really engaging. We've seen video games grow in popularity over the last few decades, and now they've become mainstream. And they're also one of the biggest uh, forms of entertainment globally as well. They're so engaging that if we look at how many people actually play video games in Australia, for example, it's two thirds of the population. So 67% of all Australians play video games, which is a pretty sizable number. What I find more interesting though, is just how much time people spend within these video games. So playing the actual video games themselves. And again, in Australia, those who play video games spend on average roughly an hour and a half each day playing games. Um, being an average, some people will play more than this and play less, of course, but nevertheless, it's a fairly large amount of time each day. Now, I want to mention one particular game called World of Warcraft, uh, as this is a really popular game that players have spent a lot of time in. It was released back in 2004, so it's been around for a very long time, but people are still playing World of Warcraft these days. It's what's known as an MMORPG, or a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Um, and if we look at just how much time, or if we estimate how much time people have spent within this one game, there was a group of economists back in 2012, so this is eight years ago now, that players, uh, they estimated that players had spent 50 billion hours playing World of Warcraft, which is a lot of time. So that equates to about 6 million years, which is as much time as we've spent evolving as a species. So imagine if we spent that time doing something else a little bit more productive. 
So the thinking goes then, if games are so engaging and motivating, how can we use game design thinking to our advantage to make other contexts more motivating? And that is exactly the idea behind gamification. So gamification has been defined as the addition of game elements in non-game activities. And really the idea of applying these game elements to non-game activities is try to make them more appealing and motivating in the same way or the same vein that games do. And what's interesting is we've started to see more and more applications in software over the last decade or so start to include more game-like elements. So for example, we've got some very uh, normal looking software here, a to-do list, an exercise tracker, and a social network. And what's interesting is over the last 10 years, we've seen new applications being released in these same areas that have looked much more game-like. So all of a sudden our to-do list looks like a quest list, our exercise trackers were being chased by zombies, and social networks were, have points, badges, and leaderboards. Uh, I wanted to just quickly share a few popular examples of gamification in more detail from a range of different areas. Some of these you may be familiar with, and some of them you may not realize have gamification elements involved. So the first one is Fitbit. Fitbit's been around for a while now, uh, at least a decade, and it's a little device. It used to be a little device you strap to your, your pants, and it would measure your steps during the day. What was interesting was that they had game-like elements to motivate you to undertake more exercise. So uh, they had feedback in the form of your step counter for the day, so it showed your steps. Uh, and then you could see how you were going on a leaderboard compared to your friends as well. So it was a little bit of competition. Now, Fitbit didn't really motivate me, but what did motivate me to get out and running was Zombies Run. It's a completely different style of uh, app in terms of when we compare it to something like Fitbit. The difference being is that it's got this game-like narrative that unfolds as you go for a run. So you are put in the zombie apocalypse narrative and as you go out running, you hear the zombie apocalypse narrative unfold. So it's a very narrative kind of themed gamification experience or, or game. And what's interesting is that it also has zombie chases. So it makes good use of the sensor technology in the mobile phone in order to start, you basically as you're running, you'll hear zombies breathing down the back of your neck. And at that point you have to speed up and run faster because uh, the GPS sensor can work out how fast you're running. And if you don't run fast enough, then the zombies get you. Okay, in the productivity space, we see gamification being used a lot. Uh, one great example is Chore Wars, again, over a decade old now, but this was basically a tool that encouraged, uh, you could use to encourage your housemates or your children to do their chores because they were presented in a quest-like way, where if you did your chores, then you received points, loot, you could fight monsters, etc. So it was quite motivating, especially for kids. Uh, and then one which you may have come across, which is very popular, is called Duolingo. So Duolingo is a language learning tool. And what they've done is a, they've done a really good uh, approach when it comes to gamifying it. So they've made really engaging activities and then scaffold it with a bunch of different game elements uh, in order to keep you motivated, such as a daily streak, experience points, a leaderboard, and um, a bunch of other different gamification elements as well. Cool. And one recently I've come across which has changed or evolved is Google Crowdsource. And Google Crowdsource is amazing. It's basically an app where uh, you sign up and then you do things for Google that computers can't do, such as tagging images uh, and, and, and working through a bunch of other things. And what's interesting is people are happy to give their time to doing these small tasks for free. And Google have gamified the app in order to encourage people to do more of these tasks. So it's an interesting one to look at. But what about in the market research and consumer insight space? Well, there are plenty of examples from this area as well. First up, we have Beat LAX Traffic. At first glance, you may think it's a game, but in actual fact, it's a gamified airport experience survey for Los Angeles Airport. So it uses, as you can see there in the image, game-like aesthetics and elements to encourage responses from people. Next up, we are seeing gamification being used in the space of civic engagement as well. And a good example of this is Portland of Opportunity. So this is a game from the Engagement Lab at Emerson College over in the States. It's designed with and for immigrants and refugees in Portland to learn about services and provide feedback to city governments on how better to serve them. So in the game, the player basically takes on the role of an immigrant or a refugee who has just arrived in Portland and now must discover and navigate the city's services to reach their goals, as you can see in that image there. A little bit closer to home for me, there was a great tool developed uh, by JSA Creative called Plan Your Brisbane. 
So it's an educational gamification experience that aims to inform residents about city planning challenges and also encourage feedback. So it managed to engage over 100,000 residents and received over 5,000 post-game surveys. And then one that I really like is the ABC News Story Lab. So these, this group uh, from ABC News has created some great examples of surveys and data visualizations that engage people and include gamification. So these kind of experiences, there's a range of them. Uh, they're often interactive and presented in a playful way to encourage feedback from readers. Finally, gamification doesn't necessarily have to be visual or uh, delivered in a digital way. So here's the traveling data viz game, which encourages participation and feedback using playful and physical methods. So this is uh, often another thing we see in gamification that doesn't happen that often is people creating physical games in order to engage and motivate people rather than just digital video games. Okay, so that was a lot of examples. Uh, I have a link at this at the end of this presentation where you can access the slides if you want to revise any of them. So gamification looks promising. And if it's something you're interested in exploring, then I've got a few tips on how you can get started or things to think about if you're looking at designing a gamified experience in order to encourage uh, insights. So generally when talking about gamification design, I find there are three important things to consider. Uh, what is the game? or the game-like experience that you're creating, uh, who are the players that you're designing for, and what context in which they're playing. So considering these three things will help lead to a more effective uh, gamification design uh, with, that you come up with. Now, when it comes to game, over the last decade or so, we've seen a gamification blueprint emerge. And this is where people will apply one or more of the following elements to their activity. Uh, so for example, these elements include points, badges and leaderboards. Uh, now, these are great elements when it comes to games in terms of providing feedback or are they being used as reward-based game elements, but using them alone won't necessarily make your activity more engaging. When it comes to games, generally it's the activity itself or the gameplay is what keeps people engaged. So with that in mind, it's important to make the activity itself more engaging if possible, rather than just giving feedback or rewarding people uh, through the use of virtual points or badges alone. So if you are using points and badges alone, you may as well just use gift cards instead as it would be easier and probably more effective. But let's have a look at an engaging example from the ABC Story Lab. Uh, I just wanted to show you this one. Uh, so generally games have clear goals, rules on how to achieve that goal and a form of feedback. And it's the combination of these things which can create engagement in games. So often what's interesting is we have a goal that we want to achieve. We have rules that make it difficult for us to achieve that goal. Uh, and then some kind of feedback, which tells us how we're going towards that goal. So with that ABC Story Lab example, this quiz that they have here turns data visualization into a game by instead of just making it a passive uh, kind of article, it gives the reader a challenge. So it interacts, uh, encourages them to interact with the article and the data that they've come up with. And this challenge is to guess where a particular age group stands when it comes to a political issue. So as you can see, there are clear goals there. Uh, there are clear rules on how to achieve that goal. Um, and then there is feedback as well to show users how well they did. So as you can see, they've got a clear overarching goal at the top. Underneath that, each question acts as a sub goal. So that's the goal they need to achieve. And then the rules is that they can drag the slider to try and guess where this particular age group sits when it comes to this opinion. And then they get feedback in the, in the form of uh, praise and also points showing them how they're going. Now, the second important, important thing to consider is who you're designing your gamification experience for. Um, not everyone plays or likes the same kind of games. So we all play different kinds of games. Some people don't like video games at all. Some people much prefer sports or board games. Um, and it, what's interesting though, is it might surprise you who actually does play video games. As I mentioned earlier, over 66% of Australians or around 67% of Australians play video games. And what's interesting is, did you know that there is as many people aged 50 and older playing games than those under the age of 18 as well? So we're seeing a lot of older people play video games too. So when it comes to the type of gamification experience you're designing, you've got to consider who you're designing for and what they might like. Would they like a complex zombie narrative or would they like something a little bit simpler, such as the Fitbit gamification? 
Finally, considering context is really important. So this is where and when people will be providing insights and feedback. So this is something that's important to consider. Will it be on their phone, on the bus when they don't have much time? Is that where they're providing insights or feedback? So will your gamified experience need to be short? Uh, will it be over poor internet connection? And there's been some really interesting research looking at gamified surveys. And one great example found that they had a, an amazing gamified survey that they built, uh, but it didn't actually load very fast. And so it had a really low rate of uh, people filling it in. So these are things you really need to consider. Or will your uh, gamification experience be delivered to people just after they've been to the toilet? So this is a great example that I find in many different toilets, particularly in airports, where they're asking you to rate how the toilet experience was. So when adding gamification, you need to consider where the uh, experience will be, when uh, will people be interacting with it, and for how long will people be interacting with it for. So you need to design an experience accordingly for it. Okay, that should be enough to get you started thinking about game player and context. And hopefully you can create more engaging survey tools and other tools for getting customer insights and for gathering some really good data. One's just as engaging as games. Um, if you have any questions, uh, want a copy of the slides uh, or want a, a book on gamification, you can jump out onto my website, zachfitzwalter.com forward slash change 2020 for a copy of everything here today. Great. Thanks for that. Great. Thank you, Zach. That was brilliant. That was really wonderful. Um, I don't personally play games, but I do feel um, the, the need and, and it's definitely worth looking into it to empower and enact change. And um, those who are watching, if your question has not been asked, um, please bear with us. Um, it will be covered in a United Q&A session right after our very last speaker of today's event. James Fitzgerald is executive director and programming and founder of SNK. He will deliver his great tips and tricks on how to engage more people using social media to en enable an effective change. Please join me in welcoming James Fitzgerald. Excellent. Thank you uh, for, for welcoming us today, uh, uh, Jay Warren, and obviously the Change 2020 team um, at Griffith. The program today, um, Obviously, building on obviously what's gone pr previous to the discussion, the focus in, in, in my presentation today is really around, I suppose, how we can sort of gauge real time sort of behavioral insights um, from, from digital channels. Um, and as such, we'll be thinking today about what are some of the practical tools that you can use to get a better understanding of what people are likely to do, what people want to do and what people are thinking and feeling. And then also how digital channels, particularly say social platforms, can be used to sort of nudge uh, change programs and obviously drive user behavior. So today we're sort of gonna be sharing a number of different tools that you can use. Pretty much everything we're gonna be looking at today is free. And also like I said, um, trying to provide some insights on how digital and social platforms can be used both to get a better understanding of what your users uh, and audiences are interested and up to, and also how to nudge them towards whatever end goals you might have. So, if you can them. so before we sort of um, dive into the slides today, I thought I would just sort of provide a bit of context to what we're going to be discussing in, in the presentation. So when it comes to sort of understanding consumer needs and wants and sort of trying to understand the probability that people will take particular types of action, one of the most effective um, things I've found over the last probably 20 years of working in marketing and communications, whether it's to sort of, you know, drive public sector agendas or whether it's to drive, you know, private sector sales goals or whatever, you can obviously do market research and you can ask people questions to the cows come home. But the reality is, as we all know, is that everybody lies. And I think in the session today, what we're going to be really focusing on is practical tools that you can use, which are free which are probably more useful for getting at the truth. Now, if you haven't read Everybody Lies, uh, this book here, um, I'd recommend to do so. It's a fantastic read. And the general gist of the book is, look, you know, you, we lie to ourselves. you know, you lie to your boss, you lie to your partner, you lie to your kids, uh, you lie to everyone, but you don't lie to search engines because at the end of the day, if you really don't like Nickelback, you know, why on a Friday night after a few glasses of wine, do you keep doing a search for Nickelback classic hits? So the basic idea is that, you know, when it comes to understanding the truth and people's true intent and people's true 
uh, wants and needs, the, the best place probably to go to that, to, to uncover that is a search engine. And with that in mind, um, when it comes to sort of getting a better understanding of your audience, um, the, the best tool to use bar none is, is Google search. Now, later on today, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about Facebook and Instagram, particularly probably Facebook. But if I was carrying out a, a consumer insights program, the first thing I'd start with would actually be Google. And there's a, a variety of different ways we can harness Google. I mean, to, as you can see on this screen here, um, at a very minimum, you can use Google autocomplete. So let's say you're working on a project. Let's say you're working on a program. Think about autonomous vehicles. You know, what we might, if we wanted to get a better understanding of what people are literally wanting to understand the need around that query, we could look up something like autonomous vehicles space or autonomous vehicles problems or autonomous vehicle release dates. And what Google will do, as you can see here, is it sort of does this autocomplete uh, feature for you. So, you know, in, in a matter of seconds, you can get some decent insights straight from search results themselves. But for more detailed consumer insights on what people are really seeking and wanting and needing, the best thing to use is the Google uh, Ads Keyword Planner, which is what we're looking at here. Now, the Google Ads Keyword Planner lives within Google Ads Manager, and this is a free tool that anyone can use. Most commonly, this is used for Google advertising, but in actual fact, it can be used in lots of different ways. To use the Google Keyword Planner, um, all we need to do is come into the Google Keyword, go into Google Ads Manager, come into the Google Keyword Planner, which is where we are now, and just look up a topic or a subject or a theme. And what Google will do is it will show you all the related search queries and all the long tail random queries related to that. And it obviously gives you then the uh, average monthly searches and again, shows you how that trends over time. So again, if you're working on a project or a campaign, and again, let's say we're doing something around, again, autonomous vehicles. We can come onto here, look up autonomous vehicles and see the keyword trends that come with that. And obviously you can see that broken out, obviously on a monthly basis. And you can see that broken out obviously by different geographies and you can get quite granular as well. So this is this tool is commonly used for Google advertising, but it can be used far, far broader than that. In fact, if we look at um, uh, some recent research, literally very, very recent being carried out by MIT in the US, they're now starting to utilize Google search data, literally like we've just seen on the previous slide to help pinpoint COVID-19 hotspots because they are looking for correlations between certain types of search queries and then instances of COVID-19 in those areas. Now, again, the, the researchers at MIT have basically looked at things like Google searches around sort of um, uh, stomach problems and stomach pains, and then sort of using that potentially as an early signal that there could be issues there bubbling up in the background. So like we said, people lie to everybody, but no one really lies to a search engine. So again, search the Google Keyword Planner. It's free to use. Anyone can use it. It takes two seconds. And again, you have very, very uh, strong data across a range of different niches to use. But before we think about obviously working on using digital channels to sort of drive behavior change, um, like I said, search data is great for getting a better understanding, but I think we've got to understand first of all, why is something like Facebook, why is something like LinkedIn, why is something like you know Instagram effective uh, in the sense of driving behavior and why is it a great way to test hypotheses and experiments? Well, if we think about how the digital landscape works, and again, if we can just scoot onto the next slide, really nowadays, when we think about the web, the web is mobile first, and it has been uh, since 2016. So since 2016, we've really seen the internet primarily now being driven by mobile. In fact, if you look at time spent on, on desktop and tablet, I mean, desktop has gone up since COVID-19, but prior to COVID-19, which is obviously a black swan event, you know, desktop usage have been steadily coming down for some time, and so has tablet. So really, when we think about the web, um, obviously the gateway to the web is the smartphone. And again, it has been the case for about four years. This is interesting to understand because if we think about it, when you use your uh, computer versus when you use your phone, we access information in very, very different ways. So via your computer or your desktop or your laptop, your gateway to the information superhighway was your browser. And for most of us, myself included, the Google home screen, uh, the Google search bar is probably your home screen. But when it comes to uh, mobile, people access information in very, very different ways to what they do on desktop. In fact, when it comes to mobile, 
Mobile is all about apps and the browser on your phone, whether it's Google Chrome or Safari or Firefox or whatever, uh, DuckDuckGo, whatever you use to access uh, the web. Um, browser usage is only about 10% of app usage. The overwhelming app category by a significant margin is social media. So social media and comms make up the lion's share of smartphone usage. In fact, social media is the main thing that people do on the internet and it has been now uh, for about a decade. Prior to social media being the number one internet behavior, I think watching pornography was the main reason people use the information superhighway. So in some ways we can say we've progressed, but based upon what I see in my social feeds, I'm not sure sometimes if that is the case. So really, when we think about the role of social, social is the main thing that people do online because it's the main dominant mobile app category. Obviously, COVID-19 has sent both app usage and mobile usage and internet usage through the roof because obviously these three things are linked. You know, when we think about what COVID-19 has done since the uh, onset of COVID-19, we've seen uh, mobile app usage grow by 40% year on year, which is mind boggling. And if we think about it, you know, obviously if social media is the main app category and app usage is up 40%, well, obviously Facebook's been a major beneficiary of that. Instagram has been a major beneficiary of that. And in fact, when you look at the, the top apps in the world, the top apps in the world based on monthly active users are Facebook, followed by WhatsApp, followed by Facebook Messenger, followed by Instagram. And to say that obviously Mark Zuckerberg is a powerful guy uh, it, it is not an understatement. You know, Mark Zuckerberg literally has the whole of humanity in his palm. And it's fascinating because in many ways now, you know, particularly the way the Facebook share offering worked, Mark Zuckerberg has complete control over a empire which is 2.8 billion people strong and he, he literally can play Nero over what happens in the world so when we think about the role of social media you know social channels are great for behavior change campaigns because we have great reach but we also have very high uh, daily usage so average time on Facebook per person per day is about 35 minutes Average Instagram usage per person per day is about 30 minutes. So all up social media usage per person per day globally on average is about an hour and 25 minutes. And it's that scale which really makes social platforms ideal for uh, behavior change projects and programs. And I think when we think about, you know, the Facebooks and Instagrams of this world, which is basically the same thing, it's really the, the scale that they have. It's the time spent per person per day, but it's also the sophistication of what they offer, which really makes it powerful for behavior change, for the better. But, oh, oh yep, on to the next one. It can also be used irresponsibly, uh, or it can be used negligently, or it can be used uh, in, in, in a very sort of uh, unsavory way. And some of you might have seen this earlier on this week. There was a whistleblower at Facebook who came out at the start of this week and basically said, look, and again, look it up. Don't take my word for it. It literally came out a couple of days ago. There was a whistleblower at Facebook that basically said, look, I was a relatively middle manager within the data science team. And I personally had the ability to either stop in the tracks or just ignore, you know, large scale propaganda disinformation campaigns. And again, it's a really, really interesting read because yes, obviously social platforms can be used to drive behavior change in the right way, but they can be used in a very, very damaging way as obviously was the case in the 2016 US federal election. And likewise, you know, we're seeing this right now with the 2020 election as well. So like I said, with, with the social platforms, they do have an unprecedented scale and sophistication, but harnessed in the wrong way, obviously the impact on society can be very, very bad indeed. Now on the, on the, the good side, though, is because of these issues that we've seen, um, there is now greater scope for transparency. So it, it, another tool which we usually recommend to use for insights is the Facebook ads library. So the Facebook ads library is a free tool and it's essentially a research tool. It's a record of every single Facebook ad running in the world 
by every single individual advertiser. And again, you know, we can break these out by election things, politics issues. You can look by brand, you can look by individual. And this is a great way to learn and understand about how do different organizations and even different entities drive behavior change within uh, the Facebook and Instagram wider ecosystem. Also with the Facebook ads library, it's a great way for you to think about how to harness your message in the right way. You know, for example, if you want to speak to a particular audience cohort and you know that another entity is already doing well with that cohort, you can look at the messages they're running. And again, it can help inform how you might communicate and how you might express the thing you've got coming up. In fact, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to look at a very interesting and very, very relevant and timely example, you can go and have a look at what Donald Trump is running right now. So if you go on to the Facebook ads library, just type in Trump. And with the Facebook ads library, you have to obviously make sure you're filtering by the appropriate region. Now, Donald Trump, uh, thankfully, doesn't have any ads running in Australia at the moment. So when you do this to begin with, it won't show any results. But this is literally what he's got running in the US right now. And in fact, you can see the dates on some of these campaigns, which you can see up here. So we can see the message which uh, is being pushed. We can see the copy and the language and the tone which is being used. And again, we can see the channel platforms which they're running on. If you look closely down here, you'll notice that there is 101 ads using that. And there is 106 ads using that. And again, this is a great way for you to learn about images and visual and, and copy, um, because obviously it's all very well saying, OK, we want to do this nudge campaign to get people to go and do X, Y and Z. But if you're not expressing your information in the appropriate way, it's not going to work anyway. So the Facebook ads library is a fantastic research tool to use to get a sense of the messaging language and tone, which is resonating. And again, to maybe inform some of your sort of um, views and ideas around how you might express your, your, your campaign messages. Because this is a political one, we can actually dive in a bit deeper. Um, and literally by just clicking into the campaigns on the previous screen, we can see that these particular ones I've just shown you, particularly that one there in the middle, the socialism Trump you one, uh, which I think is probably you know, quite catchy for certain uh, audiences in the United States right now. If you click into the summary details down there, if you just go to the next screen, this is the information that we can see. So we can see, for example, that these ads are being pushed hard in Florida. Surprise, surprise. Obviously, that's one of the key battleground states in the upcoming election. And likewise, interestingly, these campaigns are being pushed hard in Florida to female, uh, females, excuse me, you know, 55 to 64 and 65 plus. Now, like I said, because this is a political campaign, there's an added level of transparency that you wouldn't normally have if this was a consumer campaign. So if this was, you know, Coles trying to push a message, you wouldn't have any of that. So whilst the Facebook ads library is, is, is a good resource to use, the other way that we can generally get a feel for audiences and insights within Facebook is by using some of the targeting tools. And this here is obviously the interface that you use if you're ever going to run an ad within Facebook. Now, when you're running Facebook ads, obviously, we can sort of look up, you know, age and gender and, and what will happen in as you sort of tweak your parameters, you will then obviously start to see how many people have those interests and how many people meet those criteria. And as you can see here, you know, Facebook can get very, very granular. You know, for example, I recently, like two days ago, uh, my wife uh, had, a, well, we had a baby, another one. So, you know, for example, you could target people with three children or children that are under a certain age. So from a consumer insights point of view, what we can start to do is plug in some of these insights and then see how many people you could reach on the platform. And you might think, well, how does Facebook know who's got three children? How does Facebook know who's just had a child? How does Facebook know who um, is recently changed jobs? Well, Facebook actually leverages millions and millions of off platform signals. So what you tell Facebook about your life is a tiny, tiny slither about what it really knows about you. So again, Facebook is, is highly insidious in terms of how it gathers information. And that's really what goes into informing the AI. So it doesn't matter if you call yourself John Wayne or your real name on Facebook. The important thing to understand is obviously the system has a lot of intel in the back end. The clever stuff in terms of nurturing behavior um, and driving interest is obviously though when you harness what are called custom audiences. 
So when you target people using custom audiences, we can target someone because they've been to your website recently. You can target someone because they're in a database that you have. Or if you're doing gamification stuff, we can target people based upon how they're interacting maybe with an app. But we can also target people based upon how they interact with your current content on the platform. And one thing which works really, really well is we might say, okay, look, we're going to run a behavior change campaign. And what we're going to do is we're going to serve up a series of videos to people. And then based upon how much of the message they consume, we will, in, we will determine from there how interested they are. So what we could do, if you just go to the next screen, is we could say, okay, let's serve someone this video to do with uh, autonomous vehicles. And whoever watches 50% of that, we will then serve a next one and we'll serve a follow-up one and we'll serve a follow-up one. And what we end up basically creating is a series of, of sequenced programs. And what this is a great way to determine is, look, if you watch that message there, you would probably be interested in this thing I have to say here. Now, how you craft your nurture sequences is completely up to you. But the fact of the matter is what we can start to do is take people on a journey gradually, bit by bit by bit by bit. And again, we can infer if you like this, you'll probably like that. And again, this is something which you can do across all channels. You know, we can do this within Facebook. We could do this within YouTube. And again, this idea of behavioral targeting, like I said, is not particularly difficult to do, but it's very, very powerful. One thing which is important to note though, no matter how strong and how sophisticated the targeting is and the profiling is within the likes of Facebook and Instagram and Google, the key though is the message. It's the creative, it's the call to action. So in actual fact, when we think about your, your activities, if you want to drive the best results, and this is what Donald Trump's team does very, very well, is you've got to test that imagery and that message again and again and again and again and again. And that's how you can sort of optimize it over time. So again, you can do basic A-B testing, whereby you might have two different versions of your message. You know, if you want to get someone to maybe go for a checkup, you can have a picture with a doctor as a, a you know, as, as a real person, or you can have a character. And again, what we can start to do is nudge behavior change with our sequences by just literally testing, 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 testing until you get it right. And like I said, that's something which in 2016, the Trump campaign did very, very well. And it's something which they're doing very, very well right now as well. But what's interesting, though, is with an a b test you obviously have your, your 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 main message and then obviously the variant of that message but the probably most exciting thing you could do in social platforms is to do what's called sort of dynamic creative optimization whereby what we would do with dynamic creative optimization is you would supply up to 10 images up to 10 headlines up to 10 call to actions and what Facebook's AI does is it delivers a personalized tailored version to each person individually based upon what it knows about them and based upon their preferences. And what that allows you to do is say, well, look, James might respond well to a blue background, but Timo will respond better to a yellow background. And at the end of the day, does it really matter what the background is? As long as you get the outcome that you need, who cares? And what we're now starting to see is the machine learning within these systems is allowing for an unprecedented degree of personalization and tailoring. And this is something which, like I said, has been in place in Facebook for a while now, but Google offers it as well. You know, with Google search engine advertising, you can do exactly the same thing. And likewise with um, uh, the Google sort of display network, which is on the next slide, we can do the same thing again. So what we can do is we can take your message, take your campaign, take your requirement, and we can say, look, I, I don't really know how this needs to look to get a consumer to respond, but I know what the gist of the idea is. I know what the point of the message is. And what we'll do is we'll set that up in lots of different permutations and we'll let the machine learning and the AI run it for us. And again, whichever is the best version is what wins the day. And that's really now where we start to see these platforms coming into their own. And I think it's just probably understanding that, you know, us as sort of decision makers, we don't really know what's going to work best. And even if you ask people, they don't know either. So what we can see now is by leveraging advanced targeting and then leveraging the machine learning, put in your ideas, put in your concepts and let the machine learning figure out the right way to say the right thing to the right person to drive the right outcome. And I think that the, the main takeaway is the less humans are involved in decision making, the better a lot of these things appear to be working. And that draws my presentation to an end. 
Thank you, James. Um, it was brilliant. Awesome tips on how to nudge consumer behaviors with digital channels. Um, when I saw Mark, I was like, yeah. And I, when I heard the older stats, I went like, wow, that's really impressive, but also frightening. But I think we can definitely benefit from it to make more change. Um, I've been waiting for this um, time to come. It's time for our Q&A session. Let's bring our two other amazing speakers back. And from now on, our co-chair, Alex, will take over. So Alex, on to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been working in the background, making sure everything runs smoothly. And now uh, we're moving into the Q&A session. So thank you for everyone who sent their questions through. I've created them and I will be asking them to, to our speakers. Uh, first off, I just want to say congratulations, James. Um, you. Bring your, 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 third, your third little uh, child to the world. That's, that's great news. Um, and also thank you to the speakers for doing such a great presentation. It's been extremely insightful uh, watching this and, and helping us get change uh, in a digital version. Um, and that's something, as J1 mentioned earlier, we certainly did not want to let COVID stop us and we still wanted to uh, bring about uh, the word of change. All right, so first question. So I'm going to mix these up and do a little bit uh, in a random order. Um, so if we can try to keep the responses to one or two minutes per question, that'll be great. But if you want to elaborate a bit more, that's that's totally that's totally fine. Um, all right, uh, Simone, I've got one for you first. Uh, it's from Isabel. How would you transition to autonomous? Uh, what would the? How would you? Uh, transition to autonomous vehicles and what would it look like? Uh, currently, there's a large number of cars on the road still being uh, used, uh, but they're still being built as well and they're not even electric. So how can we use the current resources we have and not put more resources into um, autonomous vehicles? That's a really good question. So there are a couple of different ways of looking at this. One, our poor beleaguered governments are going to need to step up. So for instance, in some cities and countries in Europe, they're saying there will be no combustion engine cars in the CBD after 2025, for instance. So we need some really hard signals to both industry and to consumers that they need to change the way that they're purchasing vehicles now because they're normal car will have no resale in a few years. So that will do a really good job of directing people's behavior. I think also looking at that incremental change, like embedding those features into existing transport options and encouraging people to activate them, not leave them switched off would also help. Yeah, great. And it's a great follow on question. Uh, this is from Kishi and she says, not to sound uh, negative, uh, but my take from Simone's presentation is that it would bring redundancy and take away from the human value. Uh, subsequently, a larger part who aren't rich of the human's population and livelihood uh, would be a loss leading to maybe increased crime or other social issues. Is that being considered um, into, into the current consideration? Really kind of good that? questions there and lots of different questions packed in there. Um, privacy is absolutely going to be a massive issue and James has touched on that a lot as well. We think we're in control, but we're actually not. There's a lot of stuff happening in the background. And the point about crime, for instance, well, in the days when all the cars around us have got 36 degree cameras running, you're not going to be able to commit any crime unless you're walking or cycling to get there because if you're using a car, there's going to be a record of it. So um, our world is going to be completely different. And yes, there are some, I guess, Yes, um, social freedom issues there. Just like you can't hop on your horse and ride it down the freeway now, you're not going to be allowed to drive your car down the freeway within a few years either. It'll be mandatory for the car to take responsibility for that. So those changes are going to happen. Some people are going to be very unhappy about them. A whole bunch of people in driving related jobs are going to lose their current occupation. And we need to be really proactive around that and make sure that we put systems in place to assist those people and to smooth the process as much as possible. Yeah, great. And, and Alice had another like question again with the transition to to autonomous vehicles. Um, so those who, who obviously can't easily be able to afford an updated vehicle, will there be? And what, I guess do you foresee? Will there be dis disempowerment uh, from when people from from when when more autonomous vehicles are on the road? This is another really good reason why it's essential that we prioritise autonomous public transport. We have to nail that. And that way we're making sure that the equity issues are addressed. But also in terms of um, packs that can convert an existing vehicle to an autonomous vehicle, they're saying that they can get that down to under $2,000. So um, hopefully we won't be pricing too many people out of contention. Yeah, great. Um, I've got a few more questions for you, Simone, but I'm, I'm gonna go around and, and, and do a, a few more. So um, James, um, so I, I guess, can there still be success on social platforms without a budget? Uh, 
many not-for-profits and charities, they don't really have big budgets. Uh, and probably a lot of people on, on our channel, and I've, I've worked in corporate marketing where our budgets have been so tiny, it's, it's been very hard to get any success with it. What's your recommendation in terms of managing digital with smaller budgets? I think, to put it cruelly, if you mm. don't have any money, it's going to be very hard for you to play. Um, and I think what we're really starting to see now is that when you think about the likes of Facebook and Instagram and the rest of them, you know, we have what are called organic marketing opportunities where, you know, Griffith Uni might do a post on Facebook or post on Insta. Um, organic activity in social media is very, very imprecise. You don't really know who's hitting it. And again, the results are very, very random and, and unpredictable as well. So if you were talking about driving predictable business outcomes, that cannot be done without um, media spend. Um, what we are seeing is I think social platforms are having to shift their, their offering. You know, we see this now with Instagram and Facebook with the likes of Facebook shops and Instagram shops, they're having to change their offering because it won't be very long until, I mean, it pretty much is pay to play on Facebook already, uh, but it won't be very long till it's the same in other channels as well. So I think if you don't, I think from a decision-making point of view, um, it, look, if you're on the, if you're on the coal face, Alex, and you don't have any cash, then you've got to do the best that you can do. But I do think there's a lot of organizations that really need to question the value of what they're doing. You know, for example, there's a lot more free opportunities available in the Google part of the internet than there is in the Facebook part of the internet. And you may well say, well, look, you know, like, for example, for our business, we don't really do any or get unpaid activity in social media. Why? Because it's ineffective and it's a waste of our time. In fact, we would be, be doing other things rather than be doing that. So unfortunately, the bad news is that it's pretty much pay to play. And it's a case of get budget or go and do something else if you want predictable results that are impactful. And is there any platforms that you would recommend uh, as an alternative to Facebook currently? We'll put it this way. I think, look, even in Facebook, there, there are unpaid opportunities. You've just got to work really hard to uncover them. Um, so, you know, like, for example, in Facebook, you know, for a page, you know, Facebook Live works really well. Facebook groups can be quite powerful, doing more with Facebook Messenger. But what we're starting to see is it's just fragmenting. So previously, if you got into the Facebook news feed, it was happy days. Today, if you want to get a similar result, you'd have to probably do 20 different things on the platform. But I think the important thing to understand is, is that this whole idea that something is free and something is paid is a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a, conf a confusion because even through the unpaid stuff takes time, which obviously costs money. So there is lots you can do on Facebook to drive reach without paying for it. You'll just have to do a lot of tactics a lot of the time. But again, we would say, look, you know, uh, Google with things like search engine optimization offers probably better results than, than organic Facebook stuff does nowadays. And likewise, Google Maps has got a lot of good stuff happening. YouTube's a fantastic resource. Instagram is still good for free. LinkedIn's getting better. But again, it's just that idea that there are lots of free opportunities online, but they actually do have a cost, which is time and usually production. Mm, great. Cool. Um, Zach, so we've got this question from Naomi. And she was saying, what kind of provider would we get, uh, would we go to develop a gamified program or website or phone app? An instructional designer, a web developer, how can we know that they understand the behavioral aspect of games and gamification? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, I mean, gamification is becoming a more developed industry now. So you will find design agencies or, or advertising agencies, marketing agencies that have done some gamification in the past and so have some knowledge of, of how to create uh, gamification uh, experiences. Um, and then there are also dedicated gamification providers as well from different areas which you can go to. So generally you wanna be looking for someone who's done something in the past and done something well in the past uh, because there's been, you know, they've been around for a while now, this, this concept of gamification. Uh, so you can usually find some good examples out there. Yeah, great. And, and we had another question come through from Rachel. So how do you raise the awareness of particular gamification uh, and how would you like collect the, the collect data from? Uh, for example, I don't even, I didn't even know about the uh, Brisbane Planet app, but I live in Brisbane. Mm, good question. And I guess this comes down to, to advertising as well. So you've got to, once you create something, create an experience, you've got to share it with the world. And so, you know, Facebook advertising um, or having some kind of, of marketing that you do uh, in order to share the actual experience that you've created is super important. Uh, mm -hmm. You can get gamified 
ads and, and marketing as well. Uh, and there are some companies that actually do that in order to create more engaging experiences. But again, it's a matter of, of, of getting it out there and sharing it and spreading the word. Yeah, great, Zach. Um, got another question for, for you, James, from Samantha. Uh, could you give us um, some examples of some of the free elements by Google? Um, so obviously your, your, your website. So again, at the end of the day, with your website, um, if we, if we look at most communications online, so, you know, when you think about Facebook and Instagram, like even if you're Kim Kardashian with 50 million followers, you don't own that audience, you lease that audience. And all it takes is a change in, in an algorithm, and all of a sudden you're getting in front of nobody. So with that in mind, we, we, we've been saying for about 10 years, the most, probably the two most important things, and again, this ties back to Zach's point, the two most important things that you have to raise awareness online is your website and your email database. So by investing in your website, by investing in optimizing your website so that it appears prominently in Google search is a relatively straightforward thing to do and yields almost instant benefit, particularly if you don't have an ad budget for, for, for social media. Likewise, you can obviously work with Google My Business. So Google My Business is a free tool for businesses. I think Google My Business will rapidly become more important than your Facebook page in time. It's already starting to happen. Um, so Google My Business is a tool that you can use. And that ties in with Google Maps. You know, to me, I think Google Maps is one of the single most important uh, apps around uh, across any category. And again, to, to really make the most of Google Maps, you've got to tie in with Google My Business. So between you know, but doing search engine optimization on your website, using Google My Business, using YouTube, and again, taking the time to understand how the YouTube algorithm works, those three opportunities on their own are probably more beneficial than organic stuff on Facebook and Instagram combined. Right. Great, that's really insightful. Thanks, James. Um, Simone, I've got another question here for you. Um, so how would autonomous vehicles work for regional areas? Would it be a matter of being on the grid, for example, Melbourne Metro, and then off the grid for regional areas? Not necessarily. And in some ways, regional areas are almost easier to introduce autonomous vehicles because there's much less traffic and we tend to have just single long straight roads. So autonomous vehicles work in multiple ways, but the, the ones that are being introduced at the moment are primary determined by sensors. So as long as we could get them to use the special paint along the side of the regional roads that the autonomous vehicles can see and recognize, then they would be safe in that kind of environment. Um, of course, you've probably heard on the media, things like kangaroos tend to throw autonomous vehicles out because they've got weird trajectories with the way they jump. So there's still work happening around the background, around all those algorithms, but um, huge promise in regional areas as well. And actually on a per capita basis, there are more accidents and deaths in regional areas. So it is a real priority. Yeah, great. Uh, and another thing too, and talks about accidents and deaths and also talking about the jumping kangaroo, that is an excellent point before. Will there be a moral code uh, that we can ever agree upon? So, for example, to avoid a crash, does you know the versus the driver versus the elderly couple walking on the road, or was this one of the reasons why this will halt the adoption or even the the policy around um, autonomous vehicles? I love this question because it worries so many people, but it is such a furphy. So, for example, my 19-year-old just got his license and. Nowhere along the way did anyone tell him how to prioritise the pram over the child versus the nun versus the whoever else happens to run on the road. We just use our human instincts to try and address that situation. An autonomous vehicle that has 360 degree awareness and is monitoring and vigilant 100% of the time will anticipate any of those oncoming issues way before a human can and it will obey the road rules so we have road rules already they exist it will obey those and um, but it will have better outcomes because it can anticipate much faster yeah great and, and that is something a, a lot of people are concerned about and i've read a lot in tech magazines and, and other publications that's something that has been considered so it's really great to get that insight uh, zach mm. uh, now, this is something you mentioned before in your presentation in terms of, of obviously, there are, there are, I guess, other ways to use gamification. And so Gabby asks, is there any way that gamification can work to help um, people thinking about the environment and sustainability? Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, so I guess any way in which you are trying to teach someone something or, or to, to engage someone with teaching, whenever there's kind of an, an engagement or a motivational issue, then uh, gamification is likely has been applied in some way, shape or form. So especially with sustainability, teaching people about, you know, sustainable practices and things like that, uh, there's, there's been gamification examples that have helped to do that. 
Yeah, great. I got another one here uh, from Natalie. Um, do you have any examples of using uh, non-technology tools to engage vulnerable populations? Mm, good question. I'm sure there are examples out there. Uh, I know, so we, finding examples of gamification can be notoriously right. difficult sometimes because again, searching for these things, uh, you know, you need to know the right keywords, et cetera. What I recommend is there's been a lot of research done in this space. Um, and so jumping onto Google Scholar, uh, Google has a great research database, uh, scholar.google.com. And just typing in some of those keywords there, you're likely to come up with great research examples uh, and, and the effectiveness of, of what these uh, examples have been like. Because often it can be hard to find the effectiveness of some examples out there that people have shared just on their websites. Yeah, great. Um, and I also had Esther um, uh, ask, is it cost effective to design a small scale gamification project for a specific target audience, e.g. local government employees? Yeah, it can be. It depends on on the the size or the scale of your gamification project and the budget you have. Um, I mean, gamification is is kind of just a way of thinking about things uh, in the sense that you know it's it's a, a design process or a design lens, I guess, looking at something and understanding if this were to be a game or like a game, how could it be made more engaging? Uh, and then in terms of of the size or the scale of gamification projects. Uh, there are existing platforms out there that you can use if they suit your target audience. So you've got to be careful that the gamification that it provides is actually suitable for your target audience. Um, you can build your own custom gamification experience, but that can get quite expensive. Or you can just do small gamified things. So I've seen people do some really effective things in social media and marketing where instead of just posting out something, they'll uh, pose a quiz or a challenge or a question to people. So I saw a university uh, challenge uh, their their followers to come up with a, a story six words or less um, about a particular topic and the number of responses that they got on that post versus one where they were just sharing information was uh, very very different yeah great um, and i've had this one from wc013 a majority of my audience are seniors and retirees do you have any successful examples for this demographic mm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So there's probably examples out there. I would have a look at there's one researcher who's done some great things in this space called Katie Seaborn. Uh, pop her name into Google Scholar. Uh, I know she's done uh, things looking at the connection between youth and elders as well, uh, and also in mobility. Um, so have, have a look at her work. And there's, yeah, there's other examples out there. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but if you, you get in touch, I'm sure I can find some for you. Yeah, great. Now, so I was going through the, the chat channel just to pick up a few additional uh, questions that have been asked. Uh, so, Jane, this is this is um, for you. So, you mentioned that the information we put on Facebook is a very significant source of the actual information FP um, has about anyone. Uh, what other sources does FP uh, Facebook uses? Whatever you can think of and more. Mm. So, think think of think as abstractly as you can about where they could get data on you and probably quadruple that because you know like for example you know several years ago facebook inked a deal with companies like experian and um and 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 sort of similar data companies prime example uh, about three years ago i'd flown up to the gold coast with my uh, son and my wife was studying at the time so i took him up there on my own and she flew up afterwards and I, he was only one years old and it was a horrendous journey on Jetstar up there. And I remember getting into Broadbeach, running into Woolies and sort of getting him some little rusky thing, Bellamy Rusk things from, from Woolies. And then as I paid and gave him the pack and took a deep breath and walked out with the pram, I started getting served ads in my feed from Bellamy's for that exact rusk that I'd bought about three minutes earlier. And the reason for that is... The data company, I forget the name off the top of my head now, but the data company that gets all of the stuff from the supermarket um, has a deal with Facebook. So everything you buy and pay for on your credit card and everything that you put on your club card, whether that's in Coles or Woolies or Tesco or Sainsbury's or anything else in the world, that information goes to Facebook as well. So every financial transaction you make goes there. Everything you buy in the supermarket goes there. You know, it's tracking your whereabouts, you know, who knows how many times a second, you know. So like it's even going off of your nearest uh, 4G towers and, you know, what your, your bit rate is, because obviously it needs to know your bit rate to serve you video. So 
this is why I say like, you know, use your imagination to think as abstractly as possible and then quadruple it probably 10 times and that'll give you a bit of an idea. So Facebook tracks well over a million data points on each user and there's 2.5 billion users. So have a think about those numbers for a moment. Yeah, that's that, and that's that, that's uh, almost a scary amount, amount of data. Um, I've got another one for you, James. This is from Rachel. Uh, for startups, how can they leverage free or cost affecting, uh, cost effective, um, I guess, uh, ways to communicate with with uh, with their clientele, getting the product out there using AI or mobile apps? Um, nowadays, the major digital channels have fantastic native uh, free features. So dynamic creative, which I mentioned earlier, which is in both Google and Facebook ads, that's that's free to use if you're using the platform. So there's no need to really go and use a third party piece of tech. The existing platforms offer a lot of excellent stuff just within their, their existing offerings. So there's no need to go and do that. Um, Generally speaking, you know, if you don't have any money for, for, for advertising online, um, like we said, search engine optimization is probably one of the most important things to prioritize. That will bring you website visitors and then conversions and whatever else you need. But also email is everything. You know, Despite the rise and rise of Facebook, the most effective channel to drive an outcome is email. So to come back to a question that was posed to Zach earlier about promoting your, your, your new you know, gamification app, how do we get the word out? Well, if you haven't got any money, the best thing to probably do is send out an email to your existing database. And, and this is the thing, and even in this era of all the clever stuff that Mark Zuckerberg offers you, the most effective channel bar none to drive an action is email still. If you don't have an email database and you don't have any money and you don't have any, a website, then you're in trouble. Mm, mm. Um, Zach, got another one for you. So it's all about knowledge and gamification and, uh, um, and how to transfer to an actual behavior. And this is from Diane. So, um, so for example, uh, for instance, a game that teaches people how to recycle correctly, would this game knowledge transfer uh, be or to the, the actual recycling behavior? Would it be like a non like knowledge transfer to the, to the, the behavior of, of, um, of recycling? Yeah, good question. I love this question. So it depends on how close to the actual activity the game itself is that you create. So there I've seen a great uh, gamified recycling bin where you get points every time you put in the recycling as quickly as possible when it lights up. Uh, that's a, an initiative of the Volkswagen uh, fun theory, which actually was just a marketing initiative and it's a very popular one. Uh, they also did the piano stairs, which some of you might've seen. Otherwise, in terms of the other side of thing, if you're trying to teach someone about something, so uh, teach it and, and so they can apply that knowledge at a later date, uh, gamification can be effective in terms of, of making education more engaging. Uh, a great example, we had one of the, uh, one of the PhD candidates uh, at QUT where I did my PhD, he was looking at fire safety training, which everyone loves. Uh, and previously it was just clicking through slides and then answering questions, but he actually turned the fire safety training into a, an engaging game where you know parts of the, the building would uh, light up and you'd have to put things out very quickly. So it was, in terms of knowledge transfer, it's probably more, more engaging for people to actually practice that. Um, how, it, how it worked in, in real life application, I don't know, we didn't have too many fires. So it's probably a good thing. Um, we've, got, we've got two minutes left, so I'm going to ask two quick questions. Uh, James, the first one's going to go to you. Uh, how do you use Google Keyword Planner, and is it free? It is free. So you need a Google Ad account. So you go into Google Ads, create a Google Ad account, go into Google Ads Manager, uh, and you'll find it within the main navigation. Anyone can use it. You don't need to be a brand. You don't need to be a marketer. So anyone can go and use it. So go and create a Google Ad account. It doesn't matter if you never run an ad in your life. It's a, it's probably one of the best research tools in the world in any field, and it's free and instantaneous. Great. And so my last question for you before we, we wrap everything up, um, I guess we're talking about, this is a follow-up from Gabby's question before, and I think you answered it partly. But when we're talking about the roads and the special paint they use, what sort of happens if, if, when, when, when we have storms and, and trees get fallen down and there's heavy dust if we're going towards it's like the Gully Basin um, or going out to near, near uh, central Australia where dust does quickly, quite often goes across the road? How, how, they sort of, uh, how do they manage to detect that? 
True. So the cars are just limited by the technology. So they use radar and LIDAR to detect, but they have the same limitations as a human in that if it's a severe dust storm, if it's hailing, if it's snowing, they can't see through that. So just like a human would need to pull over and not operate in those environments, then the autonomous vehicles have the same reaction. I noticed the question, you know, about a tree falling across the road. So that kind of camera work can detect things like a tree across the road. And the neat thing, is, of course, is that once one car detects that tree, it can communicate to all the other cars who might be wanting to travel in that same region and also alert them to the fact that the tree is down. Oh, it's going to be a good that. autonomous future. Yeah, like a mesh network almost. Um, now, I just wanted to say to everyone, um, thank you uh, for providing amazing insights, Simone. I love the way you, uh, you you showed us behavior change in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles at scale and what to expect. And Zach, for showing us that formative research can actually be fun. Uh, for, for the researchers in, in the audience, we know that more probably than you <laughs> quite, quite well. Uh, and, and James, sort of explain to us, you know, the, the, all those data points and how connected they are in terms of the, the social world and what, how powerful those insights are actually are um, in terms of that. So really appreciate everyone uh, for, for uh, coming to the event. And I really appreciate um, the speakers for, for giving us your insights and helping us launch change for our 2020. Uh, it took us a little while to get off the ground in terms of in the last part of the year, but it's great. Um, for those who haven't registered for our next change event, uh, it's happening in October. Um, uh, with that, and we encourage you to to sign up for that. It's a, it's a great thing. It's all about systems systems view and systems thinking, um, and how to take the focus away from the individuals. Um, and we're going to be looking at how to address societal problems and identify factors that might not necessarily be apparent. So, please, um, you know, consider coming to our next one and supporting the change conference and the change movement. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing everyone in our next um, event. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.